Jeez, who's on this before? <laughs> Stuart Sinkin. <laughs> yeah. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back to the 2021 PGA Championship here at the Ocean Course at Kew Island, South Carolina. Pleased to be joined by world number 21 currently, uh, Lee Westwood, who is playing in his 22nd career PGA Championship. Um, Lee, I want to take you back a little bit to 2012. You, you were playing some of the best golf of your life, really. Uh, it didn't go as well here. You didn't make the cut. But what, in your best recollections, was that because of what was, uh, looked like in, uh, a ridiculously tough golf course? Or was it just you weren't in form that week? Or what are your recollections? Uh, I don't think I put it very well. Um, I think I was leading greens in regulation through two rounds and missed the cut. So that's pretty self-explanatory. Um, I just remember it being a good golf course, tough golf course. It rained, so that made it a little bit easier, softened it up. Um, I don't remember there being stupid, you know, stupid amounts of breeze or wind. I, I imagine it can get really windy here. Um, but yeah, I just didn't put well enough. Okay. Uh, questions for Lee? All right, let's go to number six, please. Ian. Hello, Lee. Um, Hi. That back in 2012, there was a really strong British and European sort of showing on the leaderboard. Is there anything about this place that makes you think that it, it, it suits the, a British or European challenge? No, not really. Um, no, no explanation for that. Just so, good players, uh, I guess. Yeah. So how would you characterize the course? Um, it's kind of like most courses up and down this coastline. You know, it's... Uh, there's penalties for hitting it offline, which is great. And, uh, you know, the, the, the greens are good. Some, the good variation of them, some upturn sources, some, you know, where the ball gathers in. Um, obviously, there's, there's, there's always a bit of breeze, which you have to control your ball flight and your spin. And um, I guess it's a, um, a good striker of the golf ball, uh, golf ball's got kind of golf course, really. Um, at the same time, you need a good short game because... I don't think you're going to hit as many greens as normal. I think it comes out as one of the hardest golf courses on tour. And, uh, you know, you just have to have a good all-round game, really. Okay, let's shoot out to number 10. Jeff, please. Uh, Lee, given the great run in Florida, where are you at right now with your form? Yeah, good. Uh, played all right last week. Um, just managed to scrape into 21st for 15 under. <laughs> and... Uh, um, yeah, I like I like the way I'm swinging it, hitting it, and uh, yeah, all, every part of my game feels feels good. Uh, I needed a three weeks off after Hilton Head and uh, came back refreshed and ready to go again. And last week was good prep for this week. When you're going to a place, when you keep hearing the label of ball strikers course, does that kind of light you up a little bit? No, not really. Um, I don't know. How I'm going to play from week to week, so uh, um, it, it's in the lap of the gods, really. And uh, I just try and get my game in as good a shape for each week as I can, and then, uh, and then try and hit that first fairway on the Thursday. Shoot out of number 11, uh, Doug. Lee, are you doing anything better now than you did 10 years ago on the uh, golf course? Yeah, I think not caring. Um, you know, just playing, uh, taking, you know, each shot at a time on its merits. I think, uh, I think a lot clearer now, and uh, um, I have a much better perspective now than I did 10 years ago. Anything swing-wise, technique-wise, game-wise? Is it, this is, this is no, no, not really. You know, my, my game's been uh, pretty consistent for 20 odd years now. I don't, I don't ever feel like it's really changed that much. Um, you know, it's uh, it's got backswing's got a bit shorter through age, but uh, other than that, no, it's uh, I, I st you know, mentally up there, I, I still feel like a 25 year old. There's a few more creaks and groans when I get out of bed in the morning as a 48-year-old, but no, my game, you know, feels pretty much where it was late 90s. I think, I think there's an assumption that when, if someone gets in to say they're, they're mid-40s and the game dips, that it's just age. Is it, is it more than that sometimes? Is it desire from having done it for so long? Yeah, I think it is. I think it's uh, probably mental fatigue and, you know, that losing the will to keep going out and working hard and practicing. I think... Uh, Physically, you know, if you keep yourself in shape, you can go out there and hit as many balls as at 48 as you could at 28. But do you want to? And, uh, you know, have you got the drive to do it? I think that's probably the first thing that goes. Did you lose it for a minute? No. The desire? 
No, I'm still here. I know you are now. Was there a, <laughs> was there a stretch a couple of years ago? No, not really. No, I've worked hard uh, pretty much all through my career. You know, I've probably been one of the last to leave the range. Um, I just work hard in a different kind of way now. You know, I don't beat as many balls as I once did. I don't, I don't think at 48 I'm going to change much in my golf swing and stuff like that. So, I, you know, I work on my short game a lot more, my putting, and, you know, I go in the gym and stretch a lot more and work, you know, work on that side of it, you know, that, that you know, keeps me moving how I want to move. Microphone number eight. Ewan. Lee, this Premier League, Super League thing is still kind of rumbling away. As someone, I mean, you're so immersed in the Ryder Cup, so immersed in the European Tour in particular. What, what, what do you think? I think there's pluses and minus for, minuses for everything. I think, uh, you know, they've obviously got a mo lot of money and they've come out and sent a few shockwaves about and uh, people feel threatened. So, uh, you, know, the, you know, the people that feel threatened are trying to combat it. Should, should we moralise about where the money's coming from and people getting paid a lot of money? Or is that unfair? Well, you could do that about everyone, couldn't you? Yeah. So I um, prefer not to get into that. Okay. Microphone seven, Alex. Just, Alex, yeah. how are you? Hey, Lee. <laughs> Fine, thank you. How are Good. you? I'm sorry I missed you at the Walker Cup. Well, that's okay. That's all right. It wasn't intentional. Yeah, I understand. It's all right. Uh, just to follow up on Ewan's question, um, if the fact that somebody could come up to you at 48 where you are today and offer you 50 million or maybe come up to you yeah, two years done earlier. That yet. <laughs> What's that? <laughs> Is this it? Well, <laughs> I'm sure, he's, the, he's I'm the, sure the Saudis would let me be the agent here if they're necessary. But, right. but the question is, is would you, would, is it hard, not necessarily you, but anybody hard to turn that down? For me at 50, it's a no brain. Or nearly 50, it's a no brain, isn't it? Somebody stood here and offered me 50 million quid to play golf when I'm at 48 and you know, a no-brainer. What happens if they offer you 50 million and it's you're not sure if you're ever going to play golf again professionally? Well, because that's, they that's may not ever get That's something off the else ground. you have to take into account. When all these things come along, it's a it's a balancing act, isn't it? You got to throw the balls in the air and juggle them for a while and see uh, see what comes up. Okay. And, and the, what other you have thing? to get all the facts together first of all. I mean, I I I you know haven't I, I can see it from both sides, but I haven't really gone into depth in it. No. One other thing, um, because of where you are in the world rankings, and you take a look down the list, with a good month, you could actually be inside the bubble for the Olympics. Is that anything you ever ever thought about? I have already pulled out. Um, I've, you know, given notice that I'm not going to play in the uh, Olympics. Okay, and just a reason why? Because I must have missed that. How did you miss that? You of all people. Um, <laughs> Many, many, many reasons. Uh, I have a few family commitments, and um, it's a. I already proved a few weeks ago that playing seven in eight weeks is not good for me, and there's already a, a lot of tournaments crammed in around there. Scottish Open, Open Championship. I need the couple of weeks off between there and uh, the FedEx in Memphis. Uh, then there's only a, another week off, and I could be playing. Um, three FedEx Cup events, the PGA, a week off, and the Ryder Cup. And I want to be in good shape for all of those. And I think going to Japan um, the week before Memphis, you know, just with all that going on is a bad idea, especially when I can't say whether I'm in it or not at the moment anyway. So I'm, you know, of an age where I need to make a plan and stick to that going forward, else, you know, my game suffers. One last thing about that. Uh, obviously, John Rahm has talked about the fact that the whole thing sounds very difficult, where the golf course is, being in where you are in Tokyo, so forth and so on. Do you think we maybe overshot in regards to bringing the Olympics to golf? I know why they brought the Olympics to golf, and, you know, I'm all for that. You know, it's uh, taking it to a, another audience and, uh, and, you know, obviously the funding from the Olympic Committee feeds down through golf, which is great. Um, I just feel like, you know, maybe they, maybe they didn't quite get the format right or the players that play in it right and the qualification right. Okay. Thank you. Okay, we're going to zoom out to Phil Casey. Phil, you're up. Unmute yourself, and you are with Mr. Westwood. Yeah, hi, Lee. Thanks for doing this. Um, hi, just wanted to... Uh, the... Can you hear me all right? Yeah, just can't see you. Excellent. Which I reckon is a bonus. No, that's, that's a bonus, definitely. Um, 
I think it's something like 15 of the last 21 majors have been won by first-time major winners. Um, so just wondering, A, do you have any theory as to why that is? Is that a, just about strength of depth in golf? And B, does it also give you renewed hope that there's still plenty of time for you to win one? Yeah, I think it's just a strength in depth, you know, and I think the lads that come out now, um, you know, are ready to win. You know, they're mentally prepared and obviously they've got great games and, um, you know, there's just a lot of good golfers around at the moment and not many majors to spread around between us. And about your own hopes for this week? Yeah, I'm playing well. Um, hitting the ball nicely. Um, I like the golf course. I think it sets up really well if I play well. And uh, like I said earlier, I'm just going to try and hit that first fairway on Thursday morning and uh, hit the green, give myself a birdie chance, and kind of get going and carry on from there. We have time for two more questions. Let's uh, zoom out to Lucas. Lucas, unmute yourself. You're with Lee. Hey, Lee, it's been 30 years since the War on the Shore Ryder Cup at Kiowa Island. I'm curious what you remember of that event uh, as a youngster. Yeah, even I was young back then. I think I was 18, watching it on TV. Um, remembered it being a good battle. Obviously, Bernard missed a short one on the last. And uh, like most Ryder Cups, it's, it was a close contest. Um, I think this is a fantastic venue um, for a golf tournament, especially the Ryder Cup. You know, it's thrills and spills kind of place. And um, yeah, it was just another exciting edition of the Ryder Cup. I think that what kind of around that era built it up to be what it is today so yeah gonna wrap it up here with Juan on last question oh, yeah. <laughs> so in connection with the Ryder Cup I mean do you how much are you looking forward to the Ryder Cup this year you were you were a vice, ca vice captain in Paris you were gonna be a vice captain here I don't know if you're gonna do both and also oh, hopefully not <laughs> <laughs> so how much are you looking forward and uh, yeah yeah really looking forward to it you know I'm, I'm I've, I've got a pretty pretty solid position in the team at the moment and uh you know, I said to the lads when I was vice captain in, 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 captain in, uh, in Paris, I said, uh, there's one thing worse than playing practice rounds at the Ryder Cup, and that's watching other people do it. Yeah. Um, you know, you, you feel like you're really missing out. If, you, if you've played in the Ryder Cup, you just want to be involved all the time. So yeah. uh, it's, it's, a, it's a, a great honor, and, uh, you know, it's, it's something you, you, once you get a taste of it, you don't want to let it go. So, and in Paris, you were very supportive of picking Sergio. I remember as a Spaniard, I have to ask you this. Will you pick him this year, and will you like to play with him again? Well, I don't know what Padraig's intentions are. Um, yeah. Obviously, I've played with Sergio um, in, in many matches in the Ryder Cup, and uh, especially foursomes. When you stand on the tee and you're pretty sh certain your partner's going to hit it, hit the fairway, or you know, you're watching somebody in the green, you're pretty sure he's going to hit it close. It's a good feeling to have. So, you know, Sergio's always been a... Uh, great Ryder Cup competitor and his um, points total proves that and um, you know it's tough to see a Ryder Cup without Sergio in it um, so we just have to see how he plays uh, from now until it's time to qualify or pick people thank you yeah. Lee thank you for your time we're glad you. you found us and best of luck yeah. this week cheers thanks be good <laughs>